WS, which is an installation, Pinocchio Pipenose Household Dilemma, which is an ostensible participatory piece, and Tree, which is an inflatable public art sculpture. So I read in an article that if Walt Disney had a porn franchise, Paul McCarthy would be its art director. <laughs> <laughs> And that is absolutely the most accurate thing I've ever read about Paul McCarthy in the whole year I've been studying him. Um, he spent his entire career subverting and challenging ethics, morals, and social norms that are propagated through American popular culture, namely by situating its beloved icons, like Snow White here, in a rival context through its films and installations. Here's a film still from WS where White Snow, or McCarthy's interpretation of Snow White, is naked and covered in chocolate syrup and sprinkles. Likewise, to produce his inflatable sculptures, McCarthy outsources labor to a company called Bigger Than Life Advertising, whose client list consists of cell phone companies that produce this innocuous advertisement, whereas McCarthy commissions this, <laughs> and this, <laughs> and this. <laughs> this quote from Dan Cameron is the backbone of my thesis research, as it highlights the distance that McCarthy creates between his work and the audience. One of the ways he does this is through the architecture of his installations. He subverts the Hollywood industry by employing its tools and methods such as a film crew, high-end equipment, and an elaborate sound stage that has some fully decorated interiors. So this brings us to our first part, the installation. So I was first drawn to McCarthy's work when I saw his installation in the US at the Armory in uh, the summer of 2013. A violent, sexualized parody of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves is an installation that is very characteristic of McCarthy, and that it is the juxtaposition of the film as well as the set where the film was recorded. The film screen can be seen above with the set below. And theater departments and critics have called the installation immersive and theme park like, but that's actually not quite right. Um, because to say that something is immersive implies a total absorption to an environment and an abandonment of one's reality. However, visitors are firmly grounded in the perch, as mentioned by Cameron, as they traverse the outside of the film set, which forms a barrier. Moreover, visitors experience the interior of the space through small windows cut into the wall, which is below. Peering into the walls, they can see the detritus. Beautiful, rather, McCarthy required that they wear these costumes which are replicas of 
the ones with Curfew were on the film. And they were also fashioned in the Curfew studio. But participation begins and ends there. And for that reason, I had to question whether or not it belonged in the larger framework of participatory art, which is defined by the audience's active role in the outcome of the work. So in other words, artists are engaged in who artists who are engaged in a participatory practice move the audience out of the role of the passive consumer and spectator and into the fabrication and production of the work. So they essentially become collaborators. However, it is only partially participatory because the audience is far from engaging with McCarthy, nor can they fully share his identity. Here McCarthy has just cut a hole in his crotch and he's shoving a chocolate-covered plush phallus-like object into his pants. And if the audience were to do that due to the limitation of the institution, or if they even assumed any of the destructive characteristics of Pinocchio's pipe nose, it would be considered vandalizing artwork. So then McCarthy keeps his audience stuck in this space between active participation and passive consumption, and thus the piece cannot be fully defined as participatory, and thus serves as another instance in which McCarthy creates distance between work and his audience. So we move on to our next context. Public art. So in the former two pieces, McCarthy made structural decisions that separated the audience from the work. In doing so, he created controlled experiences. Conversely, the third and final component is how scatological sensibility transits to public art context. And this approach was informed by the recent controversy surrounding the tree, which was temporarily installed at the Place and Dome in October. So the deadpan title is hardly enough to convince viewers of its identity as a tree alone, as well it should be. McCarthy says of the sculpture, it all started with a joke. Originally I thought that the anal plug was shaped like a Grand Cousy sculpture. Then I thought it resembled a Christmas tree, but it's an abstract work. People who find it offensive call it a plug, but for me, it's more of an abstraction. So this sculpture is very emblematic of McCarthy's work because it has oscillating meanings. As we saw in both Pinocchio Pipe Nuts and NWS, the use of ketchup and chocolate sauce is meant to represent various bodily effluvia, as well as the thing itself, as a critique on American excess and consumption. So McCarthy conceived the tree as a site-specific component of his chocolate factory installation at the Monet de Paris, which is the mint. However, I question the actual site specificity of it. Site specificity implies that a piece is inextricable from its location, otherwise all meaning is lost. A piece is self-referential and therefore placeless as tree would seemingly fly in the face of this. Tree, though, is a curious case because the site had an impact on the audience reacting to it. They vandalized it. Because they found its identity as a butt plug shocking and offensive. So authorities ultimately depleted it. And it should be mentioned that McCarthy was physically assaulted while installing this. His assailant decried that the sculpture had no place in the class, which was coincidentally a center for high end retail. So I was puzzled over this outcry over a temporary sculpture when one like Santa Butt Plug could be commissioned by the government and permanently installed in the major shopping district in Rotterdam and remained fully unscathed and being celebrated. The residents had a parade show the sculpture. <laughs> However, trees installations can ultimately be considered a brilliant experiment of curatorial placemaking that actually situates it as a tree and a critique of mass consumption, which correlates with McCarthy's oeuvre. Trees installation squares with the tradition of installing Christmas trees in public squares during the holiday season. Its large scale is reflective of this as well. I'll note the comparison between the column of Napoleon and the tree. Very similar. Further, Trees' color is one frequently attributed to mass-produced plastic toy trees. So then, McCarthy's use of color, as well as his use of vinyl, situates tree as an object of industrial production and thus a critique of mass consumption. As well, positioning tree as a critique of consumer culture is congruent within the context of the larger exhibition chocolate factory, which functioned as a literal chocolate factory that produced small trees. <laughs> <laughs> When conflated with the idea of the Christmas tree, it reads as a poignant jab of the commercialization of the Christmas holiday, which is a concept he's addressed in prior works. It is also the conflation of the abject with the innocent, you know, because the Christmas holiday is one that very much celebrates morality. If you're a good person, you get presents. If you're not, you get coal. So 
It is very much in line with the American Negro. So while the audience <laughs> had an impact on McCarthy by vandalizing it, they ultimately ended up validating McCarthy's entire <laughs> Because he questions the reality of social and ethical moral constructs, i.e., maybe don't put a book on your public. But because attacking an artist and vandalizing work because it looks like a sex toy is itself an actual crime. So then McCarthy prevails. Thank you. <laughs>